So we've all heard of levelling up, the aim of spreading opportunity outside London and the South East and better utilising the talent that exists in Northern England but hasn't yet seen its full potential. So I was interested to see this week the launch in London of a book called Levelling Up 2.0, A Blueprint for the Future by the Policy Institute Curia, where Michael Gove, the cabinet minister in charge of the project, gave a keynote speech. Could it be a sign that the concept, which was on everyone's lips when Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, maybe need some fresh impetus to get it back on the political agenda? I'm really pleased to have as my guest on the podcast today one of the Northern MPs who contributed a chapter to the book, and it's called Critical Links, Where Transport Will Drive Us to Thrive. Catherine Fletcher, uh, who wrote that chapter, is the Conservative MP for South Ribble in Lancashire and served, admittedly, briefly as a transport minister in the Liz Press Premiership. Uh, so a great guest to have on to talk about transport links in the north. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Rob. Thanks for having us. No, no problem at all. So um, just to start with, on the, the point that I mentioned in the intro, uh, the, the idea of levelling up 2.0, I guess, sort of implies that, uh, you know, levelling up 1.0 has happened and perhaps has maybe run out of steam a bit or needs a bit of a, a refresh. I mean, is that is, is that your, would that be your view that we, we need to, give levelling up a bit more uh, of a boost to sort of get it back up the agenda again? Well, so I'm going to actually take you back even further. So I didn't, I was in business. I joined, I didn't join politics till I was in my late 30s, about 2013. And I joined to deliver a Northern powerhouse. And I think that is, there's an interesting conversation to be had about what a Northern powerhouse is and how that sits in the broader arc of levelling up. And whilst there are, some themes in common. I think there are some differences as well. So we were briefly together at the Northern Research Group conference the other week and and, uh, George Osborne, who invented that phrase because he was in the powerhouse hall at Manchester and he he, he thought it was a really good way of doing it. Um, But he he was rekindling an idea, which is our great cities of the North, if you connect them together, you make them a more interconnected unit then you have got something that's like truly global in scale. And it's an enormous opportunity for us to grow. And I drunk that Kool-Aid in the 30s and I'm still pushing for it. I think levelling up is a really interesting expansion of that kind of regional opportunity idea. Because, in, in, you know, we are, the northern cities, are we're the biggest economic opportunity for growth that the country's got, you know, give us a fishing rod, you know, don't give us a fish, give us a fishing rod and off we'll go. And I think levelling up has got a lot of the measures within that. So I don't, I think it's a continuer. I don't, I, you know, has it failed, has it started? I, I think they're almost asides. But the thing that levelling up does do is say, well, actually, Devon and Cornwall, you know, perhaps doesn't have exactly the same um, uh, uh, services, education, aspiration, opportunity as London the South East has, or North Wales. Is North Wales actually really part of the same economic unit as Liverpool and Manchester, whereas Cardiff is in the same economic unit as Bristol? And I think you can start to get a bit blurry. But what I was doing, along with a load of other colleagues for this book, is basically just taking like a theme and exploring it and saying, what does what does it look like? How do we make it happen? How do we measure it? And so I was doing transport because I'm an engineer's daughter and I get quite passionate about it. So the so I'm going to be a politician that actually tries to answer your question, which is I don't think you should be saying we've had to relaunch it. I think it's a continuer. We've, we've been failed by both types of government for 50 years and you're not going to change it like that. But you, the, the effort is worth the juice that's going to come out the other end of it, in my opinion, and I bet in yours as well. Yeah, I, no, I think so. I mean, like, like at the Northern Research Group conference we were both at and other similar conferences that I go to all the time, transport, perhaps along with skills, is like the, what, the main thing that people talk about as being important. And it's, it's interesting you mentioned the, the Northern powerhouse uh, as an idea versus levelling up. My sort of interpretation of the difference is that the Northern powerhouse concept was more focused on cities and that if you grow the economy of Manchester and Leeds then hopefully the other areas around around it will will benefit whereas leveling up is perhaps more focused on the bits between 
the cities uh, and the bits a bit further, a bit further out, well, which I guess I would, what, what I'd like. Do, no, you, do you agree no, with that? No, yes and no, to be honest. So the Northern Powerhouse is about describing a massive economic opportunity. You know, you can get you put this investment in and this is the growth that comes back. And I think it has to be more than Leeds and Manchester to get that global scale. But I mean, uh, Devon and Cornwall, absolutely love it. Devon and Cornwall needs levelling up. You know, that there, there are important things to do there. But there is no world where there are four or five big cities in Devon and Cornwall that if you connected them together with improved public transport could genuinely become a globally rival, a global rival, you know, unlike perhaps some of the industrial areas in, in Germany around uh, Munich and stuff. So I think they're two mutually exclusive things. I think levelling up is about pride in place. It's about improved access, hub and spoke models. I argue in my book that you can give it a big boost by just joining up what we've got better and quicker and thinking about it in a, in a, a slightly more strategic way. You know. So I, I, can I give you an example? Yes, please do. So if you're a lad, and I'm, I'm deliberately not going to try and talk about South Ripple too much because, you know, I've had to unilaterally rename it down here because everybody gets slightly glassy, panic eyed and doesn't know where it is. So I've renamed it, you know, the bit under Preston, <laughs> which then removes some of the more... It's quite helpful, place. even for people in the north, I think. That yes, would be, uh, that, South that's Ripple, good you, know the, you know the bit under Preston. Right. So, so, but I don't want to talk about that too much, but there are some themes that just run true across really broad areas, even down to like Nottingham, Derby and the East Midlands, where I went to uni. Um, and so if you are not in a major city, um, so there was a lad from Tower Hamlets who was asking me questions at the levelling up thing, saying, aren't you going to detract from London? I said, well, actually, he said, I'm from Tower Hamlets. I said, brilliant. You, if you're in Tower Hamlets and you can get to the poshest part of London to take an opportunity, the difference is we can't get there. So say you're, kit, you're a lass or a lad that's kitchen fitting because, you know, you enjoyed yourself between 18 and 25 or whatever and, you know, did it properly. But now perhaps think, right, I want to take advantage of like the lifetime skills guarantee. You haven't got any A-levels. Government's going to give you a few grand to go and get qualification. The only way you're getting to the kitchen fitting job is because the guy or girl in the white transit van is picking you up. The bus service probably doesn't get you on time. You would be incredibly lucky if you've got a train service that gets you there. And so you're going to the job. So if you haven't got a car or you haven't got access to come with some kind of expensive personalised transport, how are you going to get to the college? And, and what worries me is, you know, sometimes people are saying, well, I need to get to work, I need to get to college, you know, and they're spending 150 quid on a three series Randover without an MOT or insurance to try and take an opportunity. And I think there is a role levelling up to me is making sure that people don't get forced into those slightly invidious choices about ed accessing education and accessing work, which is give you a lift, you know, do something perhaps you shouldn't or get stuck on a bus that's really late and doesn't turn up. And I think there's a huge amount we can do to make those very basic things work better. You know, make sure the last bus doesn't go before the last train gets in that kind of stuff. And so I had a bit of a wang on about it in my chapter. But it's not, yeah. everyone thinks it's the big stuff. It's it's big boys with big train sets. Don't get me wrong, that's important. But the usability of transport to allow people to access opportunities. And for the flip side, you know, lots. Of, I'm sure you get lots of businesses coming and talking to you, say we're really struggling to recruit. You know, we can't get sparkies. We need these types of apprentices giving them better transport links that means that they can get more people to come to work in their business within, say, like 40 minutes travel, an hour's travel, that's an economic boost. We, You know, that's levelling up as much as it is about making sure your high street isn't covered in concrete buddliers. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that if, if we could make that change and make that happen, that would be great. But how do we go about it because if you look across across the north and I, I imagine it's true to some extent in your patch as well like local bus services are really struggling at the moment and like in the northeast for example it looks like they're going to be cut by sort of 10 to 20 percent because patronage levels haven't risen to what they were 
before the pandemic. And so if it would be great if we could have services that could reliably get people to their places of employment or where they're going to get trained. But how do we get from where we are at the moment, where that is not happening, to you know the ideal scenario that you're that you're talking about? Well, um, I think the first way you get there is by some kind of northern engineering brains actually doing quite a lot of hard yards thinking. You know, I don't. The, this is not something that you can draft out in a press release and bang up on a wall and say we've fixed it. But it, you know, if you go to South Ribble, right? So we've got buses, but they have become slightly kind of hoppers for um, perhaps older people um, to go and pick their prescriptions up. So their routes are designed to cover the the services that are subsidised. They're not necessarily going to the local trading estate or thinking about connecting up to existing public transport. They're more kind of, you know, how to get into the village and pick up a prescription. And they are rightly subsidised by local councils because that's an important utility service. You've got to flip that to, I'm going to work on the bus. So you, there's a thing called the Bus Service Improvement Plan and Lancashire, Lancashire County Council are really good at this, actually. They went and they said, right, what, what's stopping people using the bus? You don't know when it's turning up. You're stood at a bus stop. You've got no idea. If it's one an hour, it's a long time to wait if you've just missed it and you don't know. So they got money from the government to retrofit transponders on the buses. Because when you know where the bus is, you can give it like a London style app. So I can sit in my house. It's not there, it's coming because it's a big refit job. But I want to be able to sit in my house and go, right, okay, so the bus that goes through on the way to Preston, it should be, the timetable says it's due at 22, but I can tell from my app that it's actually five minutes late. So I won't go and stand on the road for another extra five minutes in, you know, our delightful northern weather. So that makes it usable. So it's bits of, you know, you can improve there. But there's also things like we've got bits of stuff that's just been left to drift. So we have a train station where the train stops at a, at a platform and passengers can't get on and off because Beeching shut the, shut the train station. It's called Midge Hall. You know, literally, they stop to exchange a token next to a platform. And there's so book it too. So let's do the simple stuff. Book it too to fix it is I, I think we need a a level of investment that's between the really big stuff that DFT does, you know, Department of Transport does, and the much smaller stuff that the councils can do. It's like a 15 to 100 million pound project type. But I think we need to get, restoring your railways was a really good example of that. And I think we need to do more of it. You know, so we applied, Mitch Hall didn't get it, but those type of things. And then I think the third one, is about local leadership and empowerment because the reason we've got that gap with the second one is because perhaps we are we're too centralized and i think it shows massively in transport i think that's the place where it's most obvious you know we hub and spoke into london um you know uh, uh, the the place where public transport works best is the place with the most direct line local leadership um uh you know not many people know, but um, Michael Portillo and Sir Graham Stringer signed off Manchester's Metrolink, like back in the nineties. And you know, uh, I, you know, people tend to forget that Mister Trains himself was involved in that. But look what it's done for Manchester over the years. It's now expanded, and you know, you look at Manchester's economic growth latest set, and it's is it only but is it ahead of London and only just behind Reading? It's it's in that. Is in, so you, there's your proof. Invest in transport infrastructure over decades in a in a, a non-partisan way, and look what's happening with Manchester's economy. And it, it, I think I think it's very fair to say it starts with Metrolink. Let's do a bit more of that. You know, um, like not all conservatives think it's wonderful that we have a mayor in Manchester and a mayor in Liverpool because of the politics of it. But it's a Conservative government that has created the roles. You know, the Labour Party never devolved that power. Um, and But look what it's doing, having a, having a single office that's focused on a, a big sub-region. A bit more of that, I think, is the answer. I'm, I'm, can you tell them actually trying to answer your question? I, I can, I can. And it, it, it leads me on to the next question, which is, so does that mean a mayor... Like like Andy Burnham or Ben Houchen or Andy Street is the answer for uh, Lancashire. So I, I'm I'm sitting in Leeds recording recording this, and I never mind. I find it hard to get my head a little bit around sometimes the local politics of 
Lancashire and why the different bits can't always agree with each other. And one of the manifestations of this seems to be the failure to uh, sort of sort out a devolution deal for Lancashire and and, and potentially get a mayor. So I, I perhaps you can explain why why this hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, I I I will not attempt to. But I don't think I don't. But I think local empowerment and a mayor are not one and the same thing. I think it works for cities. I think it works less well for counties. But um, so, but Philippa Williamson is the leader of Lancashire County Council. She's got a Lancashire 2050 vision where she's off talking to her government, saying, devolve us this power, hundreds of millions of pounds worth of funding. And she's put together something that says, rather than try to fix the local government system, sod that, let's just create a deal that allows our existing local government system to feed in by negotiation because it's hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment into Lancashire. You know, let's just, let's put our rosettes at the door, boys and girls. And, you know, that 20, it's got lots of broad support across, um, you know, the unitaries in Blackburn and Blackpool um, and the, and the uh, districts. I know they're not all unanimous, but I'd encourage them to really think positively about what working together can get for us for investment, because, um when we go to London, we're all still from Lancashire. Does, does that make sense? It does. It does. It does make sense. And so, regardless of the you know the governance uh, of it, would you? Is it your view that uh, a sort of franchising type system where whoever is in charge, whether it's a, a mayor or a leader or a cabinet or whatever, they have control over the routes and the the timetables and the the, the ticket prices? For oh, buses, rather, rather than operators, because obviously that's what's happening in Greater Manchester, but other areas are not not so not so keen on that. I, I, I understand why that's superficially attractive. I think it's a bit of a twentieth century solution. To I think you know technology is transforming our lives. You know, there's lots of talk of AI at the moment. You know, I talked about putting transponders on buses. The, the idea that you have to be the person that's signing the accounts off, as is the person that controls how they connect up. I think that's a bit old, if I'm honest. I think as long as you're setting a set of criteria, which is to say to have a commercial bus route, you must have a transponder on and your information must talk to this app, which can be held centrally or, you know, you know, like, much like TFLs is. I prefer that model because then the businesses, there's a great example in Bolton, um, where I, I can't, I, I won't name it just exactly, just in case I get any of it wrong and somebody wants to shoot me. But basically, the local businesses on a big trading estate didn't have a bus service. So they tootled down to the bus provider and said, uh, could we have a service, please? We will part fund it for six months. You know, if it's not commercially viable for you after that, then whoops, you've not lost too much. But all of our staff are saying they can't get in. Crack it on now, crack it on. And I wouldn't want to lose the ability for that to happen because I think we've got so far to travel. I think we need an all comers approach. It's not just state, it's not just local government, it's not just private business. It has to be all of it. And I think, um, and I think you are, I think it is easier to have the ladies and gentlemen, there's your rosette, please park it conversation in a, in a smaller regional area like a, a count like a county deal like the lancashire 2050 vision i think it, i think you get more done that's really interesting and um, Catherine, i'm gonna just before we finish the interview i was gonna ask you something that's related to leveling up and what we've been talking about boris johnson who obviously the leveling up phrase was popularized by him in the 2019 election when you uh were elected as well, obviously, while you were talking at this book launch, he uh, the, the, on Monday the debate was going on about whether uh, the, the MPs back to the privileges committee uh, report, which said he lied to Parliament. I'm interested in your assessment of Boris Johnson's sort of legacy for places like yours in the north of England, in, in, in South Ribble. Has was Boris Johnson's premiership and its sort of increased focus on on the north a good has that ended up being a good thing for people in your in your patch do you think um I, is it so i actually helped osborne set up the northern powerhouse partnership i was only the office girl but in, in you know it was nothing fancy but in doing that i came across boris 
And, and Boris at that time really understood the opportunity and the pride in place and was searching around for a phrase to evolve it into something broader. You give him credit for that. I mean, in terms of practical action, we've, we, were, we got a town deal for Leyland. So Le- everyone's heard of Leyland Trucks. You know, since the big works went, it is a bit of a, you know, there is a factory in the middle of town right behind the market that has literally got Budliers growing out of it bang in the middle of the town when the office is. And we got 25 million from the town deal. Now, to put that into context, it's roughly twice the amount of money that the local district council gets in total council tax revenues. So it's like two years worth of council tax for that to transform that town centre. And it was and it was put a bid in and get businesses and locals together. Say what you want. If it's good enough, you get the cash. And that, um, I will, when we just need to get the asbestos out and the spades in the ground and a new market. And whatever happens in the next 10, 20, you know, however many years I'm still on the planet, I am going to drive past that and say, I helped to do that under his prime ministership. And, and when you see the kids playing in the fountains and the old ladies having a cup of tea, because it's the type of stuff that actually really makes a difference day to day. There's other stuff I could talk about, but I don't think you can hear I actually really mean it. I mean, it is clear that is a thing that, yeah, Leyland will have uh, for a long time going forward. And uh, I guess I should ask, did, did you agree with the Privileges Committee report about about him? Like, do you do you think it was it was right? Well, I'm that... down as an abstain because I was actually basically going on about this stuff. And I do genuinely think this was more important. Um, so I, I, you know, I probably could have legged it back in from that event if I was desperate to. But I, I, nobody normal cares about this stuff. They want us to get on with the job. And so I just got, I, you know, I, I got on with the job. I was presenting on the panel. You know, that's why we're having this chat. So I, I, I abstained with it. I think some of it's absolutely spot on. I think some of it may be, but I'm not, it's, it's politics. It's not what people actually, it's not what I joined to do. It's not what people want us to do. Brenda from Bristol's right. There's too much of this politics going around. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder what Brenda from Bristol would make of everything that's going on at the moment. Um, also, Catherine Fletcher. Really ducking journalists ever since she got box popped and is regretting it for the rest of her time. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure she absolutely is. Well, um, Catherine Fletcher, thank you so much for speaking to me today. No, cheers, Rob. I've enjoyed it. I, I, I hope my opinions have treated your listeners' ears.